Nick, uh, thanks very much indeed. Um, when uh, uh, when uh, Mac DeFord and Jim Matlack asked me a few weeks ago if I would be the closer at this conference, I thought, uh, you know, I, I hoped that I would be more of a, more a Mariano Rivera than a, than a Jonathan Papelbon, Nick. And I hate, I hate to say that to you. So, <laughs> but I thought I would take just a minute uh, at the outset uh, to remind us of, of the wonderful, wonderful speakers that we've had and the kind of uh, come full circle. Barbara Ibrahim, it seems to me, that, that, that wonderful talk about women and their role in Egypt and in the Arab world more broadly has really kind of brought us back to Robin Wright's initial presentation, which was grounded so, so much in individuals, not generalizations about and stereotypes, but in, in the role of, of individuals in this extraordinary and heady period in the Arab world. Um, and uh, in that, I think, is, is a great strength. You know, uh, it's, it's too easy for us to, to, get, uh, to get lost in, uh, in generalizations. It's wonderful to re be reminded that this is about individuals who have recovered a sense of agency and a sense of possibility. And that is what is so much so hopeful, as Barbara said, about, about the future. From Ambassador uh, Moasher, uh, we heard a clear and distinct Arab voice. Uh, I love the term condition of induced stability. Uh, I thought that was a marvelous uh, uh, way to describe the period before the Second Arab Awakening. Um, Joshua Landis gave us a portrait of that Hobbesian world, which is Syria today and, and uh, some things to think about with regard to the possibilities for American policy. Uh, unfortunately and sadly, uh, Jonathan has been right about the difficulties of change in Syria. And we can hope that his pessimism and, or realism really isn't borne out in the future, but I'm afraid it's likely to be. From Gregory Grouse, uh, we heard about the Arab Cold War, which is continuing uh, and which divides, divides the, uh, the uh, Persian Gulf um, in uh, his, uh, his phrase, I think it was a crescent of muddle, was it, Gregory, that we talked about. Shai Feldman gave us insight into Israeli, uh, Israeli politics, uh, unique insight and in the debate over, over uh, what to do about a nuclear weapon in Iran, which continues and in a way that illustrated the, the, the entanglement, the close connections that exist between Israeli politics and our own, and the fact that our fates, the fates of Israel and the United States as we confront this situation in the Middle East, are absolutely inextricably entwined and will remain entwined as we go forward. Uh, Ambassador Musavian, uh, gave us, there was, there was an, on the Amsterdam uh, City Hall in the 17th century, there was a sign, there was, a, there was an inscription that read something like, listen, audite alterum partum, listen to the other side. And with, uh, with uh, Ambassador Musavian, we heard, we heard the other side. Um, and we saw in his dialogue with Nick, uh, the degree to which this can be a, a, uh, an argument between Iran and the United States in which it's not even possible to uh, agree on the same facts, let alone the course, uh, course ahead. I would only say, uh, Ambassador Musavian, that having read your book, um, I think you probably have more to say to us than you were able to say from, from this podium. Um, you noted that uh, Iranian negotiators uh, in the, in, in the period when you were involved, weren't always fully informed of the um, intentions of their own government and the actions of their own government. And I have to, I'd have to say that that would never happen in the United States. <laughs> So we've heard, from, we've heard from experts, we've heard from, from people who, who know this region very, very deeply, and they've given us an enormous amount to talk about. And, and now, ladies and gentlemen, for something completely different. I want to talk about um, a couple of things. One is uh, against the background of, uh, of Libya, and I'll try to ground it in, in my recent experience in Libya. But it's about two, uh, really about two things. One is the transformation of our national security bureaucracy over the last, ten, the last decade of war. And the other is 
uh, to try to talk about with you a little bit that, that vexed and complex uh, series of ideas, uh, that trope, which we, which we uh, call under the name diplomacy and diplomats. What, the, what is it? But let me start with, uh, with the Middle East. Um, as any shorthand about, about uh, uh, geography must be, it's a, it's a profoundly misleading one, isn't it? The, uh, we have this uh, rather threatening picture of, of uh, a, red, a red sunset or, or uh, there with uh, faceless men uh, posturing on tanks and victory. And as we've heard from Robin Wright and Barbara Ibrahim and really all of our speakers, that doesn't represent the reality of, of, an, of the area, nor does that term represent its reality very well. It's really the Middle East, as the view from Whitehall, Mark Sykes, you know, might, be, might have used it as he was looking out towards the Far East. It's a European uh, and American sort of view of, of the other. And whatever can be said about the Arab awakening, one thing I think is clear, it is no longer possible for us to think about this region as an irreducible other, that place where we have to ask the question, why do, why do they hate us? Um, you know, it turns out, as we've heard from all of our speakers, that it's not all about us. It's really about them. For us, however, the, the Arab awakening has, has taken place as we emerge from a decade of nation-building wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, one of which is over, more or less, at least for us, and the other one, uh, and the other one of which continues. The glib phrase, blood and treasure, uh, conceals the costs of these adventures that we'll bear for a generation. And more to come, uh, there are no good wars. We paid for these ill-conceived adventures with borrowed money, our economy has been undermined, and our future freedom of action, including in the region we're talking about here uh, this weekend, has been compromised, as Ambassador Moasher pointed out. And we'll be paying the opportunity cost of these, uh, of these uh, wars for generations to come. And one of the things that's happened over this last decade is, is that there's been a transformation of our national security apparatus in the post-9-11 world. And I was writing a book about this, or trying to, when I was, when the, you know, the, when Chris Evans was killed, and uh, my wife Betsy sent me off to Libya for a few months. To, to... <laughs> and in Libya, you know, the, the sort of the working title had been the militarization of American foreign policy, and and in Libya, I wondered what I'd find, and I, I, I realized that the reality was worse than I had imagined, and that I had been understating the, the case. Now, the young diplomats I saw there at the American Embassy were as wonderful as ever. Um, there were a few of them and a staff of over 100 people. But they were unable to travel outside the four walls of our heavily guarded compound, uh, 50 Marines. Uh, we had anti-tank weapons in a disused swimming pool, anti-tank weapons in an embassy. Many of my Foreign Service colleagues there had served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they found this living in compounds normal, normal the normal sort of things. And when I told them that in the dim mists of the past, and the, when I had first joined the Foreign Service, I lived in the middle of the Arab Quarter in Rabat in a house that was reachable only by foot, the only European to live in that part of the, the old city of Rabat. And then when I was uh, transferred to Libya, I had driven uh, from uh, Rabat to Tripoli, shown up at the door and reported for duty, and nobody much wondered where I'd been or why I'd, why I'd, why I'd done that. It was as if I was talking about a, a world that had lost, was lost, that a world that they couldn't really imagine, a miraculous story, if you will, from another age. Now, Libyan, Libya is obviously a special case, given what happened on September 11th in Benghazi. And so we sat, I had to sit and, and uh, watch during the, uh, my colleagues and I at, at the embassy. The Armed Forces Network divides its news channel into, into Fox and M MSNBC. So half the time, you, I, we, we would listen, and it was surreal to watch the repeated you know, images of that burning compound in Benghazi and to hear the vile agitprop spew out of the television with regard to what had happened there.
Last week, uh, Libyans celebrated the second anniversary of uh, their revolt, which started in Benghazi. It was a massive and joyous celebration in uh, the historic center of Tripoli. Hundreds of thousands of people. Fireworks, Libyans love fireworks. They even set aside their pension for firing weapons and in celebration, including uh, anti-aircraft weapons, which they love to mount on the back of, uh, of uh, pickup trucks, Chinese and, uh, and uh, Japanese pickup trucks. The British ambassador was down among the, mingled among the happy crowds. There was concern about uh, the potential for violence. There was nothing at all. Celebrations when it went forward in Benghazi in the same way. The officers of the American embassy, however, were hunkered down on the airport road 15 miles away, worried about a mob attack. Over the last decade of nation-building wars and the war on terror, our diplomats have increasingly sheltered in these fortresses from which we've built and reinforced from Istanbul to Cairo, from Rabat to Baghdad, where a massive Ozymandias-like fortress will remain as a monument to our folly for decades to come. Meanwhile, while these well, our diplomats have been increasingly isolated from the populations that they are supposed to be connecting with in this extraordinary period of awakening, which is, which is, the, which is the Arab awakening. The capabilities of our military intelligence complex and our counterterrorism capabilities have developed to a remarkable degree. Uh, some of this is inside baseball, but there used to be buffers and, 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 uh, between the CIA and the FBI, for example, one doing law, en law enforcement, uh, nailing perps for a living, and the other collecting in intelligence. And uh, those, those, some of those barriers are broken down, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing, broadly. But it also contains some dangers, because these are very different, different uh, activities. One, and one relies on exclusively on the rule of law, and the other relies on breaking the law. <laughs> Our special forces over the last 10 years have almost quadrupled in size, special forces. And they're in 100 countries around the world, 100 countries around the world. It would be easier to say where we don't have special forces doing operations today than it would be to name the places where we do. The Special Operations Command based in Tampa has a procurement budget, an R&D budget, of $10 billion. $10 billion for, the, for SOCOM. $10 billion. That's within the, the overall defense budget, but it's controlled exclusively by the, by the folks down in Tampa. And that's close to the, uh, the USAID development, core development budget. I was in Libya, of course, and there's a new, a new command has been uh, created in uh, Af called the AFRICOM, sort of a little bit, sounds a little bit like uh, the Africa Corps and Rommel. Uh, it relies essentially on, uh, on special forces loaned for various purposes, didn't have its own, and in sort of its own forces, but after Benghazi seems likely to get them. It's setting up, of course, a drone base in, uh, in Niger. This Military intelligence um, complex, if you will, has become an extremely sharp sword at the disposal of the president. And in some ways, um, drones are the least of it. Now, our new Secretary of State has been speaking passionately at the University of Virginia last week about the need for um, foreign assistance, and, and he's justifying it not on the basis of so much of national security, but on the grounds that it'll actually bring home the bacon to the United States, that it's good for our economy, we sell planes in Indonesia, we, you know, it's, uh, that's what diplomacy is all about. And, and I thought maybe we, we, should, we should take just a second this with a, uh, here to talk about this hoary term diplomacy and, and, cons and consider what exactly it is we mean, we mean about it. It sounds like a very old world word, doesn't it? You know, it sounds like it's lost in the dim mists of, in, of antiquity. In fact, it's quite quite a recent one, and you know, and as the in the broad sweep of, of uh, human history, dates only to about the time of the French Revolution. 
when that, that the coinage of uh, diplomacy and a little later diplomats arises in the early part of the 19th century. Um, resident embassies, as we know them today, go back only to the period after the Peace of Westphalia when the, when the modern European state system was created. And they've been an astonishingly successful invention. Uh, before that, it, uh, states sent envoys with delegations for particular occasions, but they, the, the notion of a what Cardinal Richelieu of Fran France called a permanent negotiation, that is, an embassy stationed in this capital permanently of another country, uh, has, really, has really taken off. And, uh, you know, if there are 191 uh, states of the United Nations, they don't all fortunately maintain diplomatic relations with each other. But if you do the math, you can see how many of these institutions there are around the world. It's really been an extraordinary development. Um, Togo maintains an embassy in Japan. Now, it's certainly true that we live in a networked and a world in a globalized economy. Those crowds in, uh, in Tahrir Square, Liberation Square in Cairo, as Barbara has told us, were summoned by, by Facebook in large, uh, in large part. And it's true that the Arab Revolution has, the Arab Awakening has spread through the information revolution in, in part, but I would argue that one consequence of this is to reinforce national sovereignty uh, rather than to, rather than to weaken, us, weaken it. An Egyptian government uh, more responsive to popular opinion may be more jealous and probably will be more jealous of its sovereignty uh, the, than it has than the, than the Mubarak regime. And maybe there's a complex, and I won't dwell on this too much, but maybe there's a complex relationship between the globalized economy, the globalized information grid, which brings us all together and the forces uh, that seek us, that, that within us that seek to preserve our uniqueness, whether it's in Maine or Scotland or, uh, or, or elsewhere. It's, of course, in the name of sovereignty that Russia and China block international action on Syria today. And so in this world of the management of relations between states, sovereign states, which is really what we're talking about when we talk about diplomacy, though it has all sorts of broader uh, ramifications, it's, it's a more urgent task than ever. We need trained and skilled people to do it. But in a country of 300 million, it's remarkable how few of them we have, and we're wearing them out in harness. In the Middle East, Ryan Crocker comes to mind, and today Frank Richardone in Ankara, our ambassador, and Ann Patterson, our wonderful ambassador in Cairo. What would we think, I wonder? These are all folks who have, in many cases, been retired and brought back into har harness. In Libya, I reported to a brave and brilliant woman named Beth Jones, who many of you may know. She's been, a, she's been a, uh, an attendee at the, at the Cairo conference, and she's <laughs> setting off to the Middle East with one more Secretary of State uh, as we speak today. Beth was a retired officer, brought out, of, brought out of retirement to help Mark Grossman, another retired officer who replaced Richard Holbrook in, in the Af Afghanistan-Pakistan business. Um, there are, what would we think about a military which had to turn to retired officers, uh, retired admirals and generals, to replace its carrier battle group commanders and commanders of divisions and, and corps? That's, what we're, that's what's happening today in the Foreign Service, and I look forward to talking about this with Nick. There, there are 8,000 American Foreign Service officers, uh, roughly speaking, which sounds like a lot, but only about 1,500 of them can be said to do what we've been talking about here is diplomacy in any, in, any, uh, in any serious way. That is the management of relations between states, either in embassies overseas or in the State Department. The numbers have increased by some 30% in the last decade, but most of that uh, increase has been in the uh, bottom, bottom uh, grades, the lieutenants and captains and majors. And watching the State Department these days is a little bit like Casey Stengel and the old New York Mets. Can't anybody here play this game? <laughs> Policy is made increasingly in the White House. Uh, and that's always been the case. Presidents are in charge of foreign policy. Uh, uh, 
that's, that's been the case from, from the beginning of the Republic. That the Halcyon days of George Marshall and Dean Acheson were something of anom an anomaly against, this, against, uh, against uh, American history. But in the, uh, what's, what's grandly titled the National Security Staff now, as if it were, as if it were a, a separate uh, agency of government at the White House, there are some 300 people today. Refugees from Hill, staffs, policy wonks, Washington lawyers, able people, not so able people. <laughs> when they can get away with it, they'll deal directly with foreign governments. When somebody like Beth Jones isn't watching. But when, and when their initiatives are blocked, they often su succeed in making a muddle of things. It's really no way to run a railroad. In the State Department itself, the number of Foreign Service officers in senior policy positions has shrunk dramatically since in the last 30 or 40 years. There are various figures, and I won't, I won't try to cite them, but one, the, American, the president of the American Foreign Service Association, Susan Johnson, recently estimated that in 1985, there were 61% 61 of the senior jobs in the uh, in the uh, State Department were held by foreign service officers. Today, it's more like 26%. 61% to 26%. Now, the Arab, the Arab awakening, to get back to that, cries out for an active American diplomatic role on the ground. And the, as Arabs re-enter history, the stage is set for a new relationship between the United States and Arab states and populations as equals, as partners not as clients or targets. Some of that depends on human connections. And while civil society and its rise is, a, is an enormously hopeful uh, factor, and the relationship between institutions like uh, Barbara Ibrahim's and, uh, and, 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 and Egyptian and Arab society is enormously important, the management of state-to-state -state relations between pe by people who can make connections with Arab leaders is also important. Now, I saw this in spades in, in Libya, um, where there's a hunger for a close relationship with the United States. Uh, at one point, I was, I was sort of welcomed uh, with, as you can imagine, uh, open arms uh, when, I, when, I, when I turned up there. And, is after a while, many, many Libyans persuaded themselves somehow that the next American ambassador would be Bill Clinton. <laughs> and they were very serious about this. And I had a minister of the Libyan government ask me whether it was true. He was a little bit doubt, do, dubious about it. But he really wanted that to happen. And the wish was father to that thought. It, it's that desire for a close relationship which, which is... Uh, uh, between Libya and the United States, which is so strong. We haven't talked, we, we've talked about, we talked about Iran with, with, uh, with, with Shai Feldman, Feldman and Ambassador Musavian yesterday. The specter of a war with Iran does hang over uh, the region and the American relationship with it. The president did a brilliant job in his first term of playing for time. Draconian, unprecedented multilateral sanctions were imposed, but it came at a high price. It established a precedent with the Stuxnet attack on the Iranian nuclear facility. We may come to ruin time by rejecting any possibility of the containment as opposed to the rollback of Iran's nuclear ambitions. He's left himself a sharply reduced a margin for maneuver in the second term. Uh, the, our commander down at CENTCOM, a, a brilliant Marine named Jim Mattis, who got an undisturbed, undeserved uh, rep, rep, uh, reputation for being bloodthirsty, has been forced out a little early. Uh, and I don't have any inside information about that, but it may, it's possible that General Mattis insisted one too many times that the second and third order effects of an attack on Iran be considered. He's being, he's being replaced by a, an officer who may be better expected to stick to the military side of things. Now, all of this would be a less dreadful prospect if, as other speakers have pointed out, 
though it would certainly be no panacea, there were a successful negotiation between Israel and the Palestinians. Sadly, having sown this, the wind with 40 years of settlements, which have more or less foreclosed the possibility of a land for, for peace uh, compromise, it seems likely that Israel and the United States are poised to reap a whirlwind. Now, the more, more cheerful thought is that things are never quite as bad as they seem, and this is true even in the Middle East, where sometimes they're worse. <laughs> the landscape, the neocons before, uh, before the invasion of Iraq uh, sought to bring into being is taking shape, but it's a remarkably different landscape than the one, than the one they had hoped for. It turns out that the world isn't flat at all. And this is presenting challenges to American policy. Sometimes, as we saw in Libya with the air war in 2011 and, and uh, the, NATO, the NATO role, it may be possible to find that Archimedean point, you know, where military intervention can have disproportionate favorable consequences. And the cost-benefit analysis makes sense. But more often, in Syria and Bahrain, for example, there will be no place to stand to move the world. And the consequences of moving the world may be too uncertain in any case. The zeitgeist of, often moves in strange and unpredictable ways. And so perhaps we should ban that hackneyed phrase about being on the right side of history, because I don't know anybody who knows what twists and turns it may take in the, in the years ahead. We're going to be navigating with visual flight rules rather than setting a, G, a GPS course to the new Jerusalem. As a presidential candidate in the book, The Audacity of Hope, Barack Obama spoke of the need for a national security strategy. As president, he's mostly reacted to events. It's the old, uh, the old story about what Harold Macmillan probably did not say about his own government strategy in office and what had happened to it. Events, dear boy, events. Strategy isn't about setting high-minded goals, utopian goals, and, uh, but it's about adjusting the means at hand to the, to the, the, the ends to the, to, the, to, the, to the limited, necessarily limited means at our disposal. And of course, they're, they're particularly limited these days. But one of those limited means we have is a good career diplomatic service. Good government advocates like most of us, most of us in this uh, room are fond of decrying the notion that uh, non-career appointees are, 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 you know, embassies are for sale to the highest bidder. And some of that is going on. Diana Vreeland is not going to go to Paris, unfortunately, but uh, it, it, and it is the and it's a scandal that this is the last refuge of the spoil system in American uh, politics, but. A greater unforced error is to perpetuate the decline of the Foreign Service, which is the institution from which two-thirds of our ambassadors come. Hillary Clinton's signature reforms at the State Department uh, are, uh, are, under the, are under a four-letter acronym. Uh, it's called QDDR. And this is a 242-page document which took to almost two years to bring to fruition, uh, 500 people, and, uh, and it's a, it contains two contradictory and very pernicious ideas, in my view. The first is that sovereign states are of declining importance in the world, which is a strange idea for a foreign ministry to promote. And the other one is that the proper role of the Foreign Service, our diplomatic service, is to serve as handmaidens to the military and uh, you say to some extent in nation building in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. And that I think is e equally misguided. Let me, let me stop, uh, stop here. My time is almost up, but I want to tell you one story uh, bef before I close. Um, Ambassador Musavian suggested that the United States isn't very popular in the Middle East, and in some cases that must be, that is, I'm, I'm sure, true. I don't think 
among those places that the United States isn't very popular, I don't think it includes Iran, where, uh, where we are uh, in pretty, held in pretty good esteem by the, by the population, on the, at least uh, so opinion polls indicate. And it, another one certainly isn't Libya, where I was, where I had the privilege to be for a few months. When I got there, I went to see the president and the prime minister and senior officials, and I got out and uh, you know I went down to the Roman ruins with the minister of culture, and I went up into the Berber area, and, and that's another story we could talk about, the rebirth of Berber identity. And everywhere I went, the first thing people would say was, we're so sorry about the ambassador. But what sticks in my mind is, Late in, my, late in my tenure there, that we had a, we had a group of young, young Libyans, young, young Libyan women and, and some, some boys. They were maybe 18 or 20, come to the embassy. They, we had, the embassy has a Facebook page. It has, has 100,000 uh, people ad, who adhere to it. And they'd come to the embassy for an event. And I came down to kind of bless the, bless the gathering. And I said, to the, I said to them, I'm sorry about all the... Um, Security and the Marines in full battle dress, the fact that your cell phones were confiscated, the fact that your bags were searched. I mean, it's just, it's, unfortunately, it's a, it's a necessity. It's a sad necessity, and it's a reality. And one of the young women um, looked at me, and she said, no, we're sorry. So uh, with that, let me, let me uh, <laughs> Well done, Larry. Really well done. Larry, that was just powerful. It was impressive, and you're a truth teller. And um, thank you for being so candid about this very unusual state of affairs. We're members of the same guild. And we both started off as young people in the Middle East, and as you say, in a much more free time. And now we've got people living behind, you know, in crusader keeps, high stone, high walls. So I thought there were just three issues that you put on the table that we've got to talk about, and maybe people want to ask about it or anything else they want to ask about, and we'll come back in the panel discussion. Number one, the militarization of our foreign policy. Everybody believes in a strong defense, but I guess back in the old days, we thought that defense and diplomacy were somewhat separate um, vocations, and that they had to be equally strong, and that's no longer the case. And I guess my first question, I'll just read these out, would be, we've just, we're emerging from a decade of war. Are we gonna be forced into a decade of diplomacy because we just can't fight everybody? And we're going to have to use our wits, and we're going to have to be tough-minded, and we're going to have to have a lot of arguments, as I did yesterday with Zane. Yeah. But we're going to try to accentuate diplomacy, not war. That's number one. Number two, your point about security really resonated with me, and I think a lot of our colleagues. We've both been ambassadors. We know that we have to protect our people, obviously. Mission number one. But we train these brilliant young women and men in Arabic, in in Pashto and Mandarin, and we give them all this training, and we say, go out and, 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 and integrate with the young people of China or of Afghanistan or of Libya, and then we don't let them do that. So there's a tension between wanting to secure them, of course, but also wanting to let them do their job. And I just wanted to ask you how you dealt with that, especially in the wake of Ambassador Stevens' assassination. And third, um, I'm with you. I'm wanting to rebuild the Foreign Service. And this may be apocryphal, but it's spread so often, we've got to recite the, the tale, that um, some people believe there are more lawyers in the Pentagon than there are American Foreign Service officers. And I think it is true, there are more members of the Armed Forces marching bands, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, than there are American Foreign Service officers. Need we say more about the deplorable state of our priorities in Washington? Yeah. So I just throw those out. Well, um, and you know, you might want to take one or two. We'll take some questions. Yeah, and have a let me let me take the last one first, Nick. Uh, um, it was Bob Gates' comparison between uh, 
numbers of foreign service officers. And it's, it's kind of a strange situation, isn't it, that the last several secretaries of defense have taken up the, the, the have, have taken the lobbying, lobbying and the campaign yeah. for the State Department's budget, yeah. you know? Now, when it comes to sharing the DOD budget, that isn't always translated into quite as much as Nick knows. Uh, 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 those words don't always uh, don't always uh, follow by action. It is there are one of the unintended consequences of Bob Gates' comparison between the numbers of uh, of uh, military uh, uh, bands and foreign service officers was to shed light on the fact that there are 150 military bands, 150. So there are a lot more uh, military musicians than there are foreign service officers. <laughs> <laughs> um, just let me say one other one other thing about um, um, the militarization, this whole militarization business. It's an easy thing; it rolls off the, the tongue. You know, on the one hand, you've got the old Prussian Clausewitz who who talked about politics and uh, war as politics by other by other means. And interesting, what's happened? What happened over the last decade, Nick, in, uh, within the military establishment was that it started out with the, with the view that war was mainly about engineering, right, and, and, uh, and, and bringing overwhelming force to bear. And then somebody else came in and fixed, the UN came in, maybe the State Department came in, I don't know, some, some civilian organization came in for what the campaign plans tended to call phase four. That is, what, everything that's af after the last shot is fired. Well, a military which um, in 2000 wasn't sure about the role of politics in warfare now has understood to a fault that warfare is all about politics. And given the weaknesses of our civilian institutions in some cases, it's ready to take that over. And it's doing so, and it has done so. And that, I think, is a, is a danger, too. The State Department isn't much interested in concepts and ideas, as you know. We just, we just get on with the job, you know? It's sort of what's in the inbox the next morning, and that's unfair. And it's certainly unfair to, to uh, our former Under Secretary of State, uh, who was famous for thinking around the next corner. But it's part of, you know, if you ask a, if you ask a, a diplomat what his strategy is, he'll, he'll tell you, uh, it depends, it depends. <laughs> It's that, it's that Harold Macmillan, Macmillan uh, quote again, events, dear boy, events. And that's our fault. That's our fault. We haven't really thought through this business of what diplomacy is. Um, and the QDDR, and we're getting into real inside baseball here uh, on that one, is an indication of how muddled our thinking about diplomacy has become. And I think we need to make the case, those of us who have an, an interest in this, that um, in Washington, we need to think more about how to outwit people, outfox people, yeah. outdebate them than just outfight them. Because we simply can't use the military for every... And it's interesting, as Larry said, I found when you say things like that in Washington, the people who stand up and support you are the generals and admirals. Absolutely. Yeah. Because we have asked them to be the most intensively deployed generation Absolutely. in American history, Absolutely. from 9-11 to the last vestiges of the Afghan war. So we do need to stand up for diplomacy. I've got a project at Harvard called Future of Diplomacy Project. I walked into Harvard in 2008, and I saw all the security programs and all the military programs, nothing for diplomacy. So we can build this, I hope, over time. But thank you for your testimony today. Thanks, um, questions for Ambassador Pope? Yes, right here. Right here. Uh, yes, uh, Dan Dibner from Rockport. I don't know if you were fortunate enough to be here or have a chance to listen to last year's Camden conference. It was extraordinary, and I recommend that you would find it fascinating. This is an extraordinary one, and your final remarks perhaps were the most extraordinary of all. Last year, we heard from the military who described very clearly that they are exhausted. And they are exhausted to the point where they now believe they have to take it on to themselves yes. to find a pathway forward that is something other than either yes. super cycle politics that leads to nowhere, or perhaps the best way to describe it is rejoicing over a Secretary of State who has just retired, who is beloved by all, visited every country, 
And yet you yourself described very vividly the formal outcome of all of that. The responsibility and this question is this. In order to make the transition to what you want, it requires forceful, clear thinking, deliberate minds that can get in front of our public and describe what it is your group thinks it's important in a way that we find palatable and supportable. In the absence of that, what else would you have us do? Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Thank you. Larry. Thank you. Well, Here we are, you know, the snow is falling over uh, the Camden Hills, and uh, we're, we're, the, we're sitting here talking about these things with, the, with, with, with free citizens. And that's a beginning to all of that. Um, John Kerry, uh, when he went to the State Department the first time, showed the diplomatic passport he'd been issued as a child in Germany, green passport, a 12-year-old. So he's got some, there's, there's, there are some, there are some, he, he uh, he has a passion for diplomacy. He, he does, and, and, and the, but the question is whether he will have a passion for, and so I think in her way did uh, Secretary Clinton, to yeah. be fair, yeah. to be fair. Both of them will spend their days dealing uh, with the likes of Sergei Lavrov and uh, how Russia, did Russia, Russian, the foreign far, Russian foreign minister we talked about yesterday a bit, uh, and, um, and Hamid bin Jassim, the, uh, redoubtable foreign minister, uh, prime minister of, of the state of, of Qatar. So they'll be doing state-to-state -state diplomacy. The question is whether or not they believe there is an institutional requirement for a career diplomatic service to support that effort. And one of the things, foreign policy is always controlled in the White House and always should be and always will be, but one of the things that's happened is we have created this extraordinary national security staff which has taken to itself many of the traditional prerogatives of our foreign ministry. And that wouldn't be a bad thing, but it's not, it's not sustainable. It's not, you know, at the end of the day, against the background of, of, the, of, the, of the change in the Arab world and elsewhere in the world, this, global, this globalization, this extraordinary revolution in, in the environment in which we all live, at the end of the day, there needs to be someone representing the United States who's speaking to someone representing a foreign state. Right? And those are not formal exchanges. They can be passionate exchanges. They often are. We saw a little bit of this yesterday afternoon. And believe me, that's an understatement. Uh, the American diplomatic style tends to be, uh, you must do this, and uh, that, that rarely works. But these are exchanges between between people, between people, right? Foreign leaders, Americans, uh, Americans doing that job. They can involve tears, they can involve cold rage, but in the, in the, they are not dispassionate interactions between bureaucrats. That's what diplomacy is all about. People who can do this well are rare. Ann Patterson, Ryan Crocker, right? But in a country of 300 million citizens, we ought to be able to, we shouldn't have to turn to retired folks, uh, heroic though they are, people like Beth Jones, to come back and run that railroad. We ought to have an institution that produces them, right? Yeah. And that, in, that institution needs, needs help. And so I'm hopeful that John Kerry will turn to that. He didn't do so in his initial public statements, but one hopes that he will he will, he will come to that. And he has kept on, um, in his first, his first month, a lot of senior foreign service people. He's put, kept them in place. I think he'll look to them. That's my sense of it, at least. Um, Larry, we have a question, I think, from uh, one of the, it'll be on the screen right here, one of the remote locations from Maggie uh -huh. Samuels in Belfast. What can students do now to prepare for a position in foreign service? so that they can fill higher positions and strengthen the foreign service. Are you starting to see more students studying Arabic? I don't know about the numbers in uh, studying Arabic. Uh, I think there are. I think there's this American University in Cairo would know, would see that, it, just imp impressionistically. I have the sense that there is a lot more of that as we begin to sort of perceive Arabs not as that irreducible other, but as the, the actors in history that, that Barbara has described and others have described, that it makes, it, it makes a powerful case for engaging with them, doesn't it? Um, 
there has been a lot of recent hiring, and I think you know, I think that you know, the foreign service officers, younger foreign service officers, are as capable and able as any Americans have ever been doing that. The problem is uh, a system, a career system, and the maintenance of that career system. As I said, you know, in policy positions in the State Department, relatively fewer for the for the Foreign Service. White House taking things over, embassies as fortresses, a bureaucratic security apparat which exists to pre to prevent, in many cases, diplomats from carrying out their mission. Right. Uh, I used to say in Tripoli, Nick, and you asked the question about how, we, how I tried to deal with that. And what I would try to say to people is there's a military adage, which is force protection is not a mission. In other words, you're not doing anything if you're just sitting around guarding, guarding each other. The purpose, we've got, we have a purpose of being here. And there's risk in when we go out our, our four walls, but we've got to take that risk. Otherwise, there's no point in, have, in having us here. But it's, I have to say that the report of the Accountability Review Board on Benghazi was not such as to, although there were sort of ritual uh, incantations about, about diplomacy being a risky business, the bottom line was we need more guards and we need higher walls. Yeah. And that is where we're going in the future. And uh, so as young people think about the Foreign Service as a career, it's an honorable profession. Um, it's a great profession, uh, and it's one that, um, but I think it's one that if I had a, uh, a daughter who was interested in it today, I would urge to enter with her eyes wide open with regard to the realities of, of our, the, our lives overseas these days. The Accountability Review Board is the official Sorry. board that Secretary Clinton asked for to look into what went wrong in Benghazi. It was led by a career, well, by the most decorated career diplomat, uh, Tom Pickering seven times ambassador, and they did make that, put that emphasis on security, but I, I guess I disagree a, a bit in, in advice to young people. Uh, we have a lot of people at Tufts and Harvard who want to go into the Foreign Service. I still think there's a place. Oh, I do too. Um, and there's still lots of, there's a huge demand for young Americans who speak foreign languages, who are dedicated to the country, who are patriotic, and want to serve. I, I, um, did, I didn't mean to suggest yeah. otherwise, Nick, but yeah. Yeah. Um, let's take, we have two more questions here. And let's, t well, I'm being told by the real yeah, power that be. Time. I think the hand signals were, Jim, that you want me to. One more. One more. So he decides. Jim decides everything. Yeah. And that's a good way to run this, too. Uh, why don't we go right here? Me? Oh. Hello. My name is Seema. Thank you very much. Um, I'm originally from Iran. And, um, but raised in this country. Yeah, if you can use the mic. Yeah. So nervous. Okay. After, after this gentleman's question, um, <laughs> it's, I'm a little bit intimidated, but I'll do my best. Don't be. What I remember you saying that that young woman in Libya stood yes. up and apologized to you. Yes. That, that really takes my heart because I remember after Ambassador uh, Stevens was killed, there was a number of Libyans in the street yes. with signs yes. apologizing. However, it was a split second in our media. So I wonder if there would be a reverse diplomacy from foreign countries um, to come to this country yes. and educate us, people outside of this room, uh, that those Arabs, those Persian, Iranians um, are people, and they love Americans. I know Iran, when my family was ready to immigrate to this country, we were talk of the neighborhood. The Hamid family, they're going to America. It was an incredible thing, and my parents um, worked very hard and sacrificed a lot to send my oldest brother to this country for education. And this is why we came. This country is great, but we have to educate our general public who don't know. And since 2008, fear has been put in us that they are terrorists. They are not terrorists. Not everyone is. And what is the name of that? So I wonder, we need more Libyans, more Persians, more uh, Egyptians to come to this country and walk among us. Have coffee with us, have McDonald's with us, <laughs> and, and, and tell us about them, that they're 
major concern is education, food on the table, and safety. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. You are, of course, right. Uh, Barbara Ibrahim uh, invoked uh, our visa policies. And unfortunately, at the moment, the American Embassy in Tripoli, there, where there is a tremendous hunger for education in the United States, and thousands of Libyans, and they have adequate funds, want to come and study in American universities, the American Embassy in Tripoli is unable to issue visas to them. And that's related to the security situation. So uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, and we need to work on these issues as citizens together. So we're going to um, take a break until 11.15. We'll be back for the final panel discussion, which will run to 12.30. Larry Pope, thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. <laughs>